10 years ago, and it was for a Bible school. So you're a whole new generation, and uh, today and the next few days, I'm just going to let you know it's going to be more of almost like a story than a sermon. I preach sermons every week. I'm a pastor of a church, and so I'm fine with preaching sermons, but in a situation like this, I want it to be a little more uh, conversational. I will also want to give you permission that at any point there's just something you're like, you know, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. I also am going to give myself permission either to answer it or to not at the moment. <laughs> uh, but uh, I want you to feel free to at least ask the question. And there's a couple things we could do is I could jot it down and say, hey, I'm going to get to that. Or um, maybe if it's a question that's not quickly answerable, then we could talk during a break. So something like that. But uh, so, yes. Okay, and there's a Q&A. So, all right, so as I was talking with uh, Pastor Kyle, and he invited me to come, he asked if I would speak about technology and the arts, which I was glad to. And I just said, well, I'd like to add serving Christ with technology and the arts. And the arts and technology play a huge role in the body of Christ, and that's what I'd like to talk with you about but I do want to give a disclaimer, and that is not everybody is really has a calling to the arts, and that's probably a good thing because the Bible describes the body of Christ as different members. We all have different things that we contribute to make the whole. So if the body were all artists, it would be very dysfunctional, and I'm telling you, it's probably one of the more dysfunctional demographics among the church are artists, and, uh, and I include myself in, in that. So we need each other, but so I want to talk about this, but why is this important? Maybe you're not the artist, maybe you're not the creative, maybe you're not into craft, and that's okay because it is a part of the body of Christ, and since it works together, hopefully there's something you can learn about how that works together with someone who's non-artistic. Also, I'm going to also just kind of, this, this introduction, I'm going to share a little bit about my story. Uh, as a creative, usually when I'm sharing my story, I'm sharing my testimony. I'll give you that just in a, the 30-second version. I grew up in a Christian home, a good, solid, Jesus-loving Christian home, and I was the rebel in the household. So I was the kid that turned my parents into uh, prayer warriors. And uh, as they began to ask God, oh, please save our lost son. And uh, God answered that prayer. And I surrendered my life to follow Jesus Christ at the age of 17. And that's where we're going to pick up our story today. Because I was a creative. I began drawing at a very young age. And I noticed as I was going around, we have doodlers. You know, so how many of you are doodlers? Just confess it, all right, yep. So, so, like, not everybody does that, but you don't know it if you don't know it, you know. So I was the kid in school who didn't, who never had, like, a piece of paper that didn't have some sort of drawing on it, you know. I was always, but I didn't know that that was different. It was just kind of where I leaned into. So I love to draw. I love to do cartoons and by the time I got into high school, I actually was able to get into some art classes and get some actual training. And then eventually, this is before the days of a lot of digital um, art, like Photoshop, I began learning how to airbrush because our school had just bought an airbrush. And so I learned uh, the, the craft of airbrushing. Eventually, even started a business later in life using an airbrush, though it wasn't very creative. And, but after I devoted my life to Jesus, there, my creative efforts kind of took a different turn, and that's what I want to share a little bit about with you, but I thought it might be fun, because I'm now 51, I'm almost, I'll be turning 52 this year, but I was once 17, and so I have a picture of Philip at 17, if that is interesting to you, maybe not, but that was, uh, that was me at 17 as a new believer, 
I was, this picture is in Oregon where I grew up, and I was on my way to Chicago. I actually joined an inner city ministry right after high school and began to serve the Lord, and I've been serving the Lord ever since. But this drawing, once I, once I became a Christian, one of the things I did at the age of 19 was I took my cartooning and I wrote a 32-page comic book uh, that was shared the gospel and did some discipleship. These are just a few pages from that. I'm not going to show you all 32, but this was like one way that I was using the things that I enjoyed doing. Many years later, um, I continued to do things like tracks. Here's an example of one I did for San Antonio specific because we have the Alamo, and our church used to go down on a regular basis to the Alamo and hand out tracks, and I thought, well, it would be nice to create a tract that was specific to the Alamo. So one of the other pastors wrote the story because he was more of a historian of the Alamo, and I did all the drawings. So this was the Alamo story you may not have heard. So if you ever come to San Antonio and you were at the Alamo where we were handing these out, most people had just heard the story. So we, it went along the lines of, you've heard the story, you've heard of Santa Ana, and you've heard of the large army, and you've heard of William Barrett Travis, and you've heard of James Bonham, and it tells a little bit of the stories. You've heard of Jim Bowie, and you've heard of Davy Crockett. So these are all the big names, and then the tract takes a turn, but you may not have heard about James Norcross and William Garnett, which were two of the Alamo defenders. One of them was a Methodist minister, and the other was a Baptist minister. So, and that, that's, the, that's the kind of transition then to share the gospel, which I do with the rest of the, the tract. Also, another part of my life as a new believer was I, I loved music. It's part of that creative side, and so I was... I began to learn to play guitar and then write music. So I became a singer and songwriter early on, and that's what I did the first 10 years of ministry, uh, playing in small venues, coffee shops, uh, out on the street, prisons, wherever God opened door, living rooms, and then also getting into the craft of songwriting. So those were I have seven albums that I, I did early on in my ministry, and then God just kept, you know, steering me other directions. So the music has always been a part of my life. And in fact, last year for fun, uh, I entered the world of the new digital streaming because all of these predate uh, iTunes and Amazon Music and back in the days of cassettes and uh, CDs, which I know you guys don't know what those are, but early forms. So last year I set out to enter into this new era and begin to write and produce some digital music that I'm releasing on all platforms. So these were my first three singles last year, so I'm still involved in music. If, you're, if you like music, you can check it out on your favorite streaming platform. Just search Philip Telfer, you'll find them, and there's more to come. This is just to let you know a little bit of my, my story as a creative, as a content creator, but when you, if you're one of these people like myself who find yourself doodling as a kid and then being more into the arts, then even things like riding bicycles is just not normal. <laughs> so I can't even ride a bicycle in a straight line. So when I was in high school, I started doing freestyle BMX. And um, on my 50th birthday, the, our family has this really stupid absolutely stupid tradition where when you turn 50, they present you with a cane that's been going from to every person in the household. It's like 50 is not that old. I mean, it's old enough. But And so in order to um, just kind of come against that whole idea of getting a cane on my 50th birthday, I went out and made a video. I'll show, let you see it here. And so this is Philip at 50 years old, out on my bike still. I ride and enjoy um, not going in a straight line when it comes to riding bicycles. When I was in high school, I actually was part of a bike and skate team doing shows, being sponsored by a local bike shop. 
bike and skate shop. So who knows, you know, these interests that you might have, how God might use them, how God used that in my life when I moved to Chicago and started inner city ministry. I worked with a church and we began something called Skate Church. We built a skate park in the basement of a church back in 1990. And this was a group of people that I was very familiar with. I spent a lot of my high school years with skateboarders and BMX freestyle guys. So we spent time, uh, I spent time every week ministering to them. And my background in skateboarding and freestyle BMX was very useful and very helpful. So I'm a big believer in whatever God gives you. He's entrusted you with things. You need to invest that into the kingdom So here's some early pictures of me in the inner city doing, I would go and do shows, whereas before I was doing shows just for entertainment, now I was doing shows for the purpose of the gospel and getting opportunities to attract people through the skill of freestyle BMX and then be able to share my testimony with them. Eventually, I would be invited to go to schools, do bike shows at schools, and you know, speak to young people about uh, following Jesus through, you know, just that, op- that platform of freestyle BMX. Now, when it comes to creativity, another thing that happened was I began, uh, I was a youth pastor for almost five years, and during those years, I began to use like PowerPoint presentations, video clips, and then even trying to find ways to do video editing. I began to do flash animation. This all gets you into this whole realm of the emerging early filmmaking. And then in the year 2006, I remember, I was just thinking about this today, I jotted this down in my notes, because in 2006, I had a a pastor friend, his name's Troy, down in San Antonio, and he says, he asked me this question, Philip, what do you think of Christian films. And in 2006, I said, they're cheesy. They're, they're like not interesting to me. I don't like them. <laughs> and he was like, he says, I know, I know. He says, but there's this like church in Albany, Georgia, and uh, they like made a film called Flywheel, and he had a copy of it. And he says, I'm gonna lend this to you. He says, now it's very low budget. He says, but it's, it's a good story. And so he handed me a copy of Flywheel, and I took it home, and we watched it, and we actually did enjoy it. It was very low budget, but like, oh, this is cool. Some guys at a church making a movie, and uh, fast forward, I'll be sharing a little bit more about this. Unbeknownst to me, you know, that was made by the Kendrick brothers, so Stephen and Alex Kendrick in Albany, Georgia, at their local church, Sherwood Baptist Church, and I would have no idea that years later I would find myself working with the Kendricks and running a film festival. In the last three years, we've had it at the uh, Sherwood Baptist Church. And, but that was, I'm getting ahead of myself. I did start getting involved a little bit in visual media with film. I was invited to go on a missions trip to India in 2009. And on that mission trip, I was kind of designated the person to document the trip through film or through video and through uh, pictures. And so I, let me see here, this is, uh, I'll just show a little bit of a clip of this. So this was like my first foray into documentary filmmaking was to be a part of this mission, but also to capture it. So this is a leper colony that we went to and It doesn't have any narration, so I can narrate it to you. We were giving away, providing sandals for the deformed feet. These sandals were made by a local minister, and they were doing food distribution, kind of the common things in missions. But the next scene coming up here, I'm not really good around medical stuff. God gave me a lot of grace, but these missionaries were trained in basic first first aid care to care for the wounds of the, their feet. And so I just sat down with them, kept my camera nice and low, tried to be as unintrusive as possible. 
and then just documented just some really beautiful ministry of Jesus to uh, lepers. I won't play the whole thing. This is like a five-minute video, but this is just part of my journey. And then, uh, well, in 2007, I met Stephen Kendrick for the first time at another conference, and in a conversation that we had in the hallway uh, between sessions, he encouraged me to consider making documentary for our ministry. My ministry, I'd started a nonprofit organization called Media Talk 101, and that was a little bit too much for me to consider at the time. It would take three or four years before it would like sink in that maybe I could make a documentary. And so in the year two, in 2011, I spent the whole year making a documentary called Captivated. And uh, it was released in 2012. It was this documentary that actually connected me to your church in 2012. This is just, I'll play the trailer for you if you haven't heard about this. So. Society. The screen time for the average American child is over 53 hours a week. The digital age has swept into young adults' lives like a tidal wave. Media has taken my generation captive media was very big in helping me to escape the realities of my life. I was captivated by television. It dictated what I was going to do and when I was going to do it. It's a bigger addiction than drugs a lot of times. There is a great need for concern. Have we entered a techno-utopia or a virtual prison? Pretty much my life like consisted of media in some way, shape, or form. I just got so sucked up in it, it, it just kind of took over part of my life. Is our social experience richer and deeper, or more shallow and artificial? I was on Facebook every day, all day long. We stand a chance of roboticizing relationships. The trivia of youth are amplified by these digital tools. Men were trying to escape into the world of games. We've arranged the culture to trick their brains into thinking that they've done something when in fact they haven't. You can't think, I'll watch and I'll listen, but I won't do. Is there hope of finding freedom? I found that there's more of a freedom like without media, in all honesty. When I was able to let go, there was such incredible freedom. This world would be a completely different place if we weren't all glued to a screen. There's a need to break free from these chains that bind us. When you unplug, all of these things that are part of God's design for us begin to be restored. All right, so it was through this uh, experience, a one year of my life traveling the country with a small team, sometimes with my family, but with a small film team, doing interviews, eventually doing the editing, all the post-production, that uh, big, and then after the film came out, marketing the film, which then I began to enter it into film festivals, and it was through that that God began to connect me with this, this whole world of, it's not a very big world, but this world of independent Christian filmmakers, and they became somewhat peers of mine in this whole process which then uh, will be part of the next story that I'll be telling you when it comes to uh, filmmaking. But it didn't stop with this. After Captivated, I began to continue to do promotional media as well as short films. I'm not going to play this whole short film. This was a family film that we did uh, just to teach my children about the craft of filmmaking. So we did a this little short film that actually goes, this is back in 2013 when we created this. Mostly focused on telling a visual story. It has some narration, but uh, if you're interested in seeing that, you can see it on my website. So you can watch that, seven minutes long. We don't have time for it now. Also in my creative journey, I like to write. See, it's just... This is the problem with creatives, you know? You just can't stop. You can't just pick one thing, right? You know? I don't dance. Sorry, I don't do that. But I do like to write. And so uh, this is uh, my first young adult novel. I've written other nonfiction. But that's not as creative as just telling a story. 
I brought one cop, I brought two copies. I gave one to the Stoltzfus family. Uh, and then I brought one to just give to your church library if you want to share it among yourselves. But it's a story of a um, hardcore gamer who wants to go pro and then goes missing, ends up in a culture without a power grid and has to learn how to survive. So it's a very interesting action adventure story. But then um, more recently, just once again, serving Christ. I'm just giving you some examples in my own life, and then we're going to talk about this from a biblical worldview. Most recently, uh, the last couple years, I spent uh, two years creating an online course. So it's an educational course uh, for teens. It's free. It's called Screen Time 101. But this educational course requires a lot of technology and a lot of creativity even to produce something that's educational. So here's just the, a little bit. I'll play a little bit of the entry. When it comes to screen time, are you finding that your life is out of balance and you are losing focus? If you need help, then this is for you. Welcome to Screen Time 101. I give a little Hello. bit of an introduction. I'm Philip Telfer, but this, Director of Media Talk 101. This whole project took, uh, like I said, two years uh, to, to create. It's almost six hours of teaching content broken into little 15-minute videos with follow-along notes, quizzes. Um, I encourage you to take the course. It's free uh, if you would, and I think it'll be beneficial for you. But nevertheless... The next thing I want to talk about before we kind of get into the biblical worldview of creativity and technology and the arts is in 2014, I launched the Christian Worldview Film Festival and Filmmakers Guild with the intent of pouring into the next generation to help encourage them. And let me preface this. When I first encountered this congregation in 2012, it was because I was invited to play my documentary at an event called the Lamplighters Guild by a man named Mark Hamby. He loved the documentary. We, he and I had crossed paths at homeschool conferences because we were both homeschool conference speakers. And uh, so he reached out to me and said, would you come to my Lamplighter Guild? Can we play your documentary? Could you talk to the students afterwards, ask, answer questions? And I said, I'd love to, but I'd like to do more. I, I said, I'd actually feel God calling me to pour into this generation, and would you give me a couple classes, and I'll, I can actually do some classes on documentary filmmaking. I'll bring my cinematographer with me, and we can do some practical uh, classes on it. And it, it took a little bit of work, but I finally convinced him to do it. And so we came to New York for that event in the summer of 2012, and it was there that I met one of the students there attended this church at the time. And so we, bef we kind of befriended each other during the week, and they invited us to their farm and after the event. And then we were invited to church. Uh, so that's kind of how I ended up being connected here was through that documentary, Captivated. But that was before I started this film festival. But I was already beginning to say, Lord, how do we, how do we help this next generation, have a biblical worldview, have a heart for Jesus, but also use these new tools and technologies uh, for good uh, in the kingdom of God. And one little story, in preparation, one, once I had convinced Mark Hamby to let me do this, then the reality hit, I'd really never done anything like that before. Sometimes you just, that's another thing about creatives, you know, you don't always think it all through. Sometimes you just rush ahead where angels fear to tread. So I was going headlong into this, and afterwards I'm like, wow, now I guess I have to come up with something. I've never taught. Uh, I've, I've made a documentary, but I've never really taught anybody else. So I called up my cinematographer, John Clay Burnett, and I said, hey, we got this gig. 
why don't you come a few days early and we'll practice? <laughs> and so I reached out to a local homeschool group and I said, we need some help. I need you to get like a dozen young people to just be present and sit in chairs and we're gonna practice on them and we're gonna teach them about filmmaking. And of course, if you were a homeschool student and you got that opportunity, you might think that's pretty cool and a dozen or more actually thought it was pretty cool. So we all met at a home and we, we set up to teach. And the interesting thing was, in hindsight, was that that little group, they didn't have to be interested in filmmaking, they just had to be willing to spend a few hours learning about it so we could practice. There was a young girl, a little homeschool girl named Gwendolyn Martindale that was in that group. She had no interest in filmmaking, but after sitting through those classes, something just kind of sparked in her. She lived on a farm. She helped her family raising animals. Uh, it's just kind of a country, just a country girl. Well, she decides, like, you know what? I think I'm going to learn more about filmmaking. The next year I had started the Filmmakers Guild, she came uh, with her family and began to learn more. And she began to work on short film projects. She volunteered to help with other people's projects. And one thing led to another. She just kept gaining skills and learning how to be useful. And then eventually she uh, got a, an email about a church in Chicago that was working on a little Christmas project and they were needing volunteers. And she was a little skeptical. She's like, I kinda wanna know what this is about. So she, she wrote back to them and said, I, I'm interested in volunteering, but I'd like to know something about the script. And I'm like, gosh, good for you, Gwendolyn. Don't just commit. You need to know what, what it is you're, you're supporting. So uh, a man named Dallas Jenkins sent her the script. And uh, she looked at it and she said, oh, I think I can get behind this. So she uh, went to Chicago and she, interesting enough, they needed help wrangling animals. And she was from a farm. And so she became the assistant animal wrangler uh, on this little nativity movie. But also Gwendolyn was so just helpful and resourceful with her time and useful that when Dallas Jenkins started a series called The Chosen, uh, he gave Gwendolyn a job. And Gwendolyn has worked on all three seasons and, and getting ready to work on the fourth season of The Chosen. It's her, it's her, her living right now is uh, working in film. And that was all from just one little homeschool gathering <laughs> where we were just practicing but there was also another girl in that, uh, we've got some guy stories too, so don't, don't think it's just the girls that get, you know, get the, the film bug, but um, it just so happened in that group, they were mostly girls. And there was another girl, Ivy Sheck Snyder at the time, and she is a horse person, she trains horses. So when she sat there and, and thought about filming, she thought, wow, maybe I could use filming to capture what I do for my training. And now she's a, very, she's a nationally known uh, trainer in some specific craft of training horses. And then she also began coming to our film festival and Filmmakers Guild, volunteering. And now, and now she's married a filmmaker. But she's, she's not only a horse trainer, but she's an amazing cinematographer and editor and does tremendous work. For many years, she produced every year our kind of highlights reel from our film festival, which I'm about to, to show you our this year's highlights reel. Our film festival has two components, three days of training for filmmakers where we bring in over 30 speakers from the industry to teach classes. And then we have a, a film festival where people have submitted films and they're curated by judges and awards are given out so this first one is just a little highlights reel from the Filmmakers Guild portion, and then we've got one for the film festival. So I'll play this for you.
Yes, we actually have worship at our film conference because Jesus Christ is the most important person in the room at any given moment. So uh, this next one is just a little bit, there's the highlights reel from the film festival portion. And if I recall, I think there's a little moment where they interview Gwendolyn Martindale. I'll point her out uh, when she comes on screen. She has like a three second bit in here, but. The aspect of the festival that has grabbed me the most and just stuck with me is the relationships. I came for the film, I stayed for the people. God grabbed my heart for film through the community of filmmakers when I first visited the film festival over 10 years ago. There are so many people who have such a heart for the Lord. All the friends and, and people that just feel like family every year that you reunite with. The first time I came, I realized with every single seminar, every single speaker, people were making sure that we had our hearts right with Christ first, and then we were filmmakers. Why is it important to be a disciple first before a filmmaker? How are you going to hear God? For us, we're, we're the branches on the vine, and for there to be leaves on our branches, we need to be connected to the trunk first. Communicating with Him allows us to communicate His heart to others. If what we're striving to do doesn't have surrendered humility, That's it, Gwendolyn it can be kind of right empty. There. Screenplay, story, direction, God is giving inspiration, I will do the end of walk with the help of God. He is the one who opens doors. It's not about me trying to like force it in my own strength. My job in the film industry is to show up and worship God all day and keep my hands busy. Our primary calling to be a disciple comes down to getting out there, bringing glory to God but letting other people know about the great hope and life and peace that comes with a relationship in God. Film can be used to powerfully impact somebody. It can be used to bless somebody. This festival really genuinely emphasizes biblical truth and the Lordship of Jesus over all aspects of Okay, so that gives you, all this has been by way of just introduction, and let's talk about a biblical worldview for all of this. And my goal here is not to turn all of you into filmmakers. What my hope is that you'll serve and follow Jesus with whatever he has given you to contribute to the body of Christ. So filmmaking is just one, you just get a peek into uh, one aspect of the creative arts. The beautiful thing about filmmaking is it uses so many different uh, crafts. It's probably the most complicated art form that exists because there are so many pieces that have to come together to work. It's not just visual, it's the audio, it's technical, uh, it's set design, it's acting, it's directing, it's producing. There are so many people behind the scenes that are not even creatives, which is really powerful to, that there are a lot of people who have some of the higher paying jobs in film are not the creatives, they're the ones that love spreadsheets and uh, love to manage uh, behind the scenes. So, so there's pretty much something for everyone, but what about where do we get there? How does the church justify uh, our use of the arts in trying to reach the gospel, reach the world with the gospel. So let me just talk about creativity, craft, and skill. I know that the word technology, so we're, you kind of probably have an idea when we say technology, we're talking about modern technology, electronic technology, but the word technology basically means knowledge of a craft. So techne is actually craft, and the, the rest of that word has to do with knowledge of something, so it has to do with knowledge of a craft. But technology today, it's just how craft continues to become more powerful through the new tools. 
But when it comes to creativity, creativity is one of the gifts that is given to us by God. And I believe it's part of the special, what makes us special in all of his creation. And when the Bible says that we're made in the image of God, I believe that's part of what what way we're made in the image of God is that we can think things up and we can produce things. It's one of the attributes, I believe, in humanity that does set us apart from the animals and makes us part of that special creation. Harold Best says creativity is the ability to imagine something, think it up, and then execute it or make it. And one thing we have to remember is God is really the only original creator. Like, we are recreators. We really can't think of anything out of nothing. Any, anytime we're thinking up something and we're imagining something and then we're trying to figure out how to, what to do with what we're imagining, it's because we're drawing from things that God has already made. And nobody really has the ability to do what God does. And God actually imagined everything out of nothing. There was, no, there was no reference point when he made the rhinoceros. There was no reference point when he invented the butterfly. But he did both. You know, Think about God who, who invents a warthog and invents a butterfly. And the aesthetics that we would recognize because even you, you wouldn't have to be trained. All you would have to say is, what would you rather look at? A butterfly or a warthog? And if you're normal, you know, <laughs> you'll probably be like, ah, I think the butterfly, there's just something more pleasant about it than the warthog. And yet God thought up the warthog. So this begins to tell us something about God and his imagination. The, you know, a lot of times we see what's on the surface, but God is the one who also invented what's inside of us that functions. And actually, if you put it under an electron microscope, you would probably see a world that you didn't even know existed, and yet God sees it all. And he invented it all. He thought it up. So God is the only one who makes something out of nothing. In that sense, when we talk about being creative, we're more being recreative. We're, we're taking the things that God has already shown us, and we're using those. The creativity, though, is not enough. You can, you can have creative thoughts, but there are other elements that are important, and there's something known as craft. Craft is when you have the idea and you want to see it made, but how do you actually take that and what is the craft involved? So in the case of editing even a film, like a highlights film, you have to have some knowledge of the craft. How do you take a bunch of cinematography from people? In our case, we have a half a dozen people going around at the festival and capturing things, and then this goes to somebody, it goes to an editor. They have to know, what do I do with that? What are the tools that I use? That's all called craft. What are the tools that you need? What are the, the, the skills? And then we talk about, so that's craft or what we call technique. And then you need something called skill, which is getting better at that technique. So all these things are required. You have to, be, you have to think it up. You have to know what the craft is and be knowledgeable in the craft. And then you have to practice that craft until you can become skillful in that craft. And not everybody become, is as skilled as other people. Sometimes that's part of just their nature. Other times it's because of application. The more someone does something, the better they get at it. So this is a part of craft. So... For example, I have, I have three grandkids, and my granddaughter, Aria, who is six years old, she's, at the, she's coloring with crayons, and she made a nice picture for Grandpa. It's on our fridge, and it's, I think it's very beautiful, but it's not going to go into any museum anytime soon. You know, It's not going to be on display anywhere else other than my fridge at my house. But she thought something up in her head, but what she, what she put on that paper was not something truly unique to the world. It's stuff that she's already seen. It's kind of her interpretation of the world. And she crafted it with paper and crayons. That was the, the technique 
you know, I, she's using paper, she's using crayons, and she's, she's developing basic levels of skill. Now, her mother is very, a very skilled artist, so I have great hopes that Aria will someday <laughs> gain in her skill, but she won't be able to gain in her skill unless she continues to use the craft and practice the craft. So we, we need to have a, a solid understanding of this idea of creativity, craft, and skill based on the Word of God. Otherwise, what I'm just saying really has no foundation. I can talk about this, and non-Christian people talk about these things. But what's beautiful about this is we can talk about it in the context of our relationship with God and what God has revealed. So if you have your Bibles, let's just turn to Genesis chapter 4. And we're going to see the beginning of craft, craftsmanship. Genesis chapter 4, verses 20 and 22, it says, And Ada bore Jabal, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. So here we're given in a few short verses kind of a history of, first of all, animal husbandry and nomadic peoples. And it, on the surface, you may not see anything in that of those who dwell in tents and have livestock as being any, where's the craft there, all right? Well, you just have to stop for a moment and think about what's required to actually even create a tent if there's never been one. You can't go down to Walmart and buy a tent. You can't go to the camping store. You have to actually think up the idea of the tent. You have to figure out how is it going to be constructed, and then you have to construct it. And who knows how many iterations of the tent it took before they got something that functioned. Kind of like kids when we're playing and we're building forts, you know, and we have like a scraps of this and scraps of that. But to build a tent actually requires some sort of covering. So whether it's animal skins or some sort of fabric that's made, it requires poles which have to be shaped or carved or figured out how they're going to work on the tent. Then also we have in here the origin of music making, but if you're going to make music, and he's mentioning how they were the, he, Jubal was the father of those who play the harp and flute, but you have to create a harp, and you have to create a flute. And this takes a tremendous amount of craftsmanship to think this up. And then the other, uh, we have the, so that would be stringed instruments and wind instruments, which pretty much covers uh, most of the in instruments other than electronic instruments today that mimic wing, uh, wind instruments and stringed instruments. Then we have the origin of metallurgy and uh, metal craft, which began early on. And now we're not here given the origin of pottery or dance or painting, but all of those things are actually found in the scriptures and spoken of Unless they're being used for idolatry, they're spoken of either in neutral or spoken of in a positive light when giving glory to God. So those who play the harp, now some could argue, well, these were not the sons of Seth. These were the sons of Cain. So are these all things, are they, maybe these are the bad things in the world, you know, because they went through Cain's lineage, all these, all these so are they, are they bad? Well... We go to the Word of God, and did, did the Word of God tell us anything that was bad about this? Actually, the fact that it's noted as these were the fathers of these things, and guess what? All of these things God utilizes, uh, even in his own tabernacle. The tabernacle was a big tent. So uh, the tabernacle in, also involved uh, crafting metal. The tabernacle involved all sorts of crafts and artistry, which find their origin in the lineage. So just because it came through Cain does not mean we automatically recoil and say, oh, it must be bad. If the Bible told us that, then we would agree with the Bible. But the Bible doesn't tell us it was bad. It just says, this is where it started. 
And God uses those. So this is how we build a biblical worldview. What does God actually say about these things? Then the bigger thing is what you see as a kind of an overview, and we'll dig a little bit deeper on this in the next couple days. But to kind of give you a bigger picture, it's not so much these crafts and using these crafts. The problem always comes down to when they are utilized for idolatry. Once these things are begin to serve something other than God, then that's when it's a problem. But in that case, it's not the craft that's the problem. It's the heart of mankind that's the problem. Because these, these crafts and the use of these, the same craftsmanship that's needed to carve or to create the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat, could also that same skill could be used to craft an idol to worship a demon. And that is something that God speaks out against. Not the craft, but what you're doing with that craft is very important. And that's why serving Christ with technology and the arts is so important because technology and the arts serve different purposes. They have different goals. And my hope is that if you want to serve Christ with these, then by all means serve Christ because they don't always serve Christ. You can can serve humanity with different motivations. You might be serving self. And in the case of idolatry, you could even be serving Satan uh, with skills and crafts and technology. And what's important is that we use these things to serve Christ. And that's what uh, I was asked to speak about this week. Generally, when I'm speaking about technology for the last 20 years, I'm usually speaking with youth about the importance of guarding your hearts and having self-control, you know, so that this doesn't become what controls you like a marionette, you know. So if you, and this is an important disclaimer because I, as we talk about technology, I'm not anti-tech. I've been kind of somewhat of a geek about tech ever since I was a kid. But if tech is controlling you, then you can't serve Christ with it if it's, got a con- if it's controlling your life. It has to be under your control, and it has, ultimately it needs to be under Christ's control. But this is, a, this is a disclaimer, you know, so before you get all excited about serving Christ with technology and the arts, the, the big question is, is Jesus your master? Because if Jesus is not your master, arts and technology are going to become a master in your life. And they will control you. And they do control people. And I don't have any interest in encouraging you to go that direction. I want you to serve Jesus. So so if technology is controlling you, you will not be able to serve Jesus with this technology. you 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 can only have one master in your life. And Jesus said that. You can't serve two. You have to serve one. And also, and just kind of wrapping up this, uh, this morning, let's talk about purpose in serving Christ with technology. And I'm going to keep this very simple, and I'm going to stick to the words of Jesus. And that is, Jesus gave us two great purposes in life. And really, everything falls under these two great purposes. So I'm, no, I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. I'm here to just reiterate what Jesus has told us. And it's so simple. He said, there are two great commands, and the first one is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. So this becomes one of our great purposes. Can we use technology and the arts as an expression of love for God, uh, using all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength? And of course, then the second commandment is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So can we use technology and the arts to love our neighbor? And what's the most loving thing for a neighbor well, there's many ways, but we're going to start with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, so the gospel, the great commission to go out into all the world. And what a, what a great way to, to take technology and the arts and say, let's use technology, let's use the arts for propagating the gospel, for propagating things that speak to what's beautiful, what's good, what's lovely. Let's 
let's bring good into the world through the arts that, that reflect Christ and his goodness, but let's not let it serve other purposes. Because technology and arts can do both. They can serve God and they can serve your neighbor. You know, food, we were just talking about this uh, this morning. You know, food doesn't have to be tasty in order to function. A house doesn't have to have decor in order to function. Clothing doesn't have to have any kind of style to function. Words don't have to be poetic or creative in order to function. And yet God has demonstrated in his word that all these things matter. Decor, style, poetry. You know, many of you, in fact, this morning in my reading through the Bible, uh, I read about the first record of a song which was written by God. (laughs) He says to, well... There is another song recorded before that. That's when they were brought out of the Exodus, come to think about it. But this was the, this was the first song. We have a song recorded at the end of Deuteronomy where God says, I'm going to give you a song, Moses, and I want you to write it down and I want you to teach it. And so in that, we see that God um, is poetic in, in his words. So we learn these things from God. We learn about color, about beauty, about wonder, about taste and smell and emotions. We see drama in the scriptures. As I mentioned, poetry. We see the importance of craft. We see that God is into sounds and making noise of various sorts. Um, God is into movement, the, the movement uh, and touch and sensation. These are just like a sampling of things. We can all, we learn this from scripture. And we say, "What God, you're teaching us something about you. And we want to reflect that. So God did not intend the world that we live in to be merely, and I'm going to use a word here, utilitarian. Utilitarian just means it functions, but it doesn't have to have any beauty to it. It doesn't have to have any style. It doesn't have to but God doesn't demonstrate in his creation that it's just utilitarian. God did not design a utilitarian world. Otherwise, we would, not, we would see in black and white. Everything would look the same. It would probably, you know, look like Lego blocks, you know. <laughs> it's just everything square, everything just kind of limited. And, but we have a world that God has created which is really vast. So... We want this to. We want to see how God does that, and then say, "Lord, what do you? What are you teaching us through that?" Okay, so it looks like we're up to lunch. That's one thing I don't want to do is get between you and food. But um, do you have anything other than me just closing in a prayer, or do you guys have some other announcements?